Did the guys in the I, band ever give you crap to shave? To to shave? Yeah, to get you rid of your beard or not? Nah, they didn't care. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for checking out Party Like a Rockstar podcast. I'm your host, Joel Miller. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese spreads on the market today. They're delicious and healthy, made from a cashew and almond milk, and blended with various locally sourced fresh herbs, vegetables, and spices. There's no vegetable oils, soy, fillers, starches, or nutritional yeast. It's lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher perev, and 100% vegan. Enjoy the show. A bit of fun. Oh, um, Bodin? Bode. Bode. All right, I'm glad. Bode. Bodan. Yep. Cajun name. Uh, are, are you able to put your screen down a tiny bit, Cos? Because I just see the top of your head. Perfect. That looks great. Okay, cool. Okay. Doug Cosmo Clifford is a founding member of Credence Clearwater Revival. My second guess is Eddie Bodine. Is that right? Correct. Good enough. Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. Well, how, how do you how do you say it? Bodin. You got to get right. Huh? Cajun name. Bodin. Bodin. Pronounced Eddie Bodin. Bodin. Eddie Bodin right. is the drummer for Sammy Kershaw and Colin Ray. He's been working with Sammy Kershaw since 1984. <laughs> so I like to come out of the gates with something a little different, make it a bit fun. I know that with you, Cosmo, it's John Fogarty, John Fogarty a lot of the time. So my question to you is, did Yoko Ono break up the Beatles? <laughs> what do you guys think? <laughs> she, uh, she, she, uh, she broke my heart. I was madly in love with her in, in a secret world uh, that... Uh, you can surf with aliens. You can what? Surf with aliens. Surf with aliens, nice. Yeah, yeah I had a, I, I had a May Pang on here, who was John Lennon's girlfriend, and she was a sweetheart. She was a really nice lady. I don't know if you guys ever met her, but very, very nice. Yeah, yeah she was cool. We we had a good time chatting away about random stuff. It was good. So anyway, okay. So Yoko Ono's a heartbreaker. That's good. So um. I'm going to ask you about Woodstock, if that's cool. And my question about Woodstock is, uh, what I had read is that the Grateful Dead spent hours and hours and hours playing five songs while you guys waited. So my question to you is, what did you do during those time? As a roadie, as a, I go to the bus, <laughs> and I usually don't pay attention to a lot of the bands I found. Um, but I had on here um, oh, the singer of uh, The Young Rascals. And he said that, no, man, we watched everybody because the music was so good. So did you guys watch everybody, Cosmo? And, and what did you guys do during that time? Well, we had uh, uh, accepted uh, the gig. And had, I think had we not, there wouldn't have been a Woodstock because all the big boys uh, with, with big managers uh, we're waiting around, waiting around, uh, patiently, impatiently. Uh, and here, here's what the problem that, that we had was we had these young guys that had this concept that uh, was pretty cool, but they'd never done much uh, and uh, didn't have the experience. And they weren't planning to have the numbers there. They were planning to have 10% of that if, if they were lucky, lucky. So needless to say, there was a lot of shortages so uh, we looked at it more that way. We want we wanted to play. Uh, oh, before, let me finish. When Creedence said yes, we will play Woodstock. Everybody else jumped in. Oh, I'm surprised there weren't some broken ankles and in, in the, in the, they all jumped at the same time. Wow. And so, what did you guys do during the time that you were waiting for the dead for hours? We had a, a Bill Graham's a, a guy was there and he represented the dead and, and Carlos Santana and they didn't want anything to do with him. He was like management, you know, to, and to us, he's a guy we worked with uh, a lot and, and, and we, we knew each other. So he said, I've got anything you could want here. It's almost shameful, uh, but uh, here it is. And we've been flying all night uh, we had a, a 
te television special that went south. And, uh, and so we, we were pretty tired and, and looking. And, and we, we had finally made contact with somebody in the, in the, in the business world and, and of, uh, also who was a friend of ours. So uh, he had New York steaks, beautiful, beautiful steaks. He had a little barbecue hibachi deal going, and he had a real a nice uh, uh, bottle of uh, French wine. And we never drank before a show, but we knew <laughs> we were we didn't know if we were going to be playing or not. And a glass of wine with that steak would with, without you know without it with that steak would have been sinful. Oh, for sure. Anyway, the rest of the time we were, we were trying to get in contact with our our team. To get things set up, and then, but then there were intermittent rainstorms, uh, you know, and you, too too many live wires, too many tired people, and pretty pretty happy people, uh, you know, pretty you don't you don't uh, the, the quality control was was at question yeah. along with the weather. So I mean, there were a lot of things going on. Did we you wanted, cruise through the audience, or no, no, you stayed backstage. No, we, had, we, 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 we didn't leave each other. We stayed together. You, know, went, you may never, he may never come back. And his fate is still unlearned. And anyway, a little folk music for us there. Uh, we made contact. We got, our, we got our gear up. But it was, again, dodging the rain. And you, you don't want to get electrocuted. And, and, uh, and, and people are tired. And. And finally, finally, and, and, and then to top it all off, the, when there were, uh, was an opening, there was a hole, the dead took it, and, and they, they, you know, the dead are the dead. They, they do what they do, we do what we do, you know. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not here to, to judge, and in some ways, it, it's kind of humorous because, of, of, you know, the, the difference between the two, the two bands not so much musically as it was on the other side. We would, you know, some pretty strange stuff comes out, but it, it, but it, it was it was fitting for, for for the time. I didn't. I wasn't so much worried about that. My main worry was: Do I have all my drums? Yes, I do have all my drums. Do I have a, a, a at least three pairs of sticks? Yes, we have it, five pairs of six, you know, just going down and then waiting, you know, just waiting around for that hole. Yeah. Uh, after the dead got off, John was, was pretty hot and still, uh, you know, uh, to me, it's, it's Keystone Cops, uh, you know. It was part of, the, part of the charm of what was happening. <laughs> you got to roll with it, yeah. And, and but and it wasn't it wasn't fun. We really wanted to play and play well. I thought we played okay, considering all the things that were happening. And uh, and uh, anyway, we weren't in the movie, so no one knew we were there. And uh, we had a gig uh, with the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band the next night. We had never missed a gig in our career. Not talking but in the bars, not one 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 night. Uh, uh, and we're doing six nights a week. We'd never not played uh, if we can get, physically get there. So we, how we got there is, you know, through the through the mud and uh, farm boys with uh, snow tires getting us through the mud, and uh, we ended up finally getting to the hotel where uh, you know not much sleep uh, in New Jersey. And uh, uh, that night we played for thirty five hundred people. Oh, wow. You must have been wiped out after the second one. <laughs> no business like show business and the show must go on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that, that's all true. What about uh, Ed Sullivan? Was he cool to you? Oh, he was, he was a, just a wonderful guy. He was just a very, very smart man. He was a very intellectual guy. And, uh, and, and but he had a really big heart and he did a lot for rock and roll, I can tell you that. He and Dick Clark, um, yeah. the two guys that really, uh, from the inside of the business, brought rock and roll in uh, so it, it could you know, make records and, and have, have it be an entity, be, be something special. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. All right, I'm going to bring this into the fun aspect now because Eddie might have told me that he is a massive Grand Funk Railroad fan. Yes, sir, I sure am. I was going to see, do you have Here any cool Grand <laughs> Funk? Oh. Yeah, what's the one to like about those guys? Yeah, yeah man. I've known those guys for years. I've been trying to get uh, uh, the, the, the management and the booking agent. Apparently, uh, Mark Corner is booked by the same agent that booked Sammy. And our uh, road manager was supposed to set me up, hook me up with getting a lunch with him, but that hadn't happened yet. <laughs> we'll stay on him and you know, put a little heel under his butt. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I need to. Yeah, I've been a big fan of them. I, I, I learned, that's how I learned how to play drums, listening to Don Brewer. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Don's a good one. He, and he's a good guy. You know, those guys, uh, you know, they have their internal problems like we have in ours. I think right. ours are more severe than theirs. Uh, but, you know, at, at this point in my life and career, uh, uh, no matter what happened and how, how miserable people were, supposedly, uh, but, but uh, uh, look, what, look what came out of it, this beautiful right. legacy of music that um, three, has three generations of fans, uh, you know, I, we make millions of people happy, millions. I mean, these are things that when we first had that dream when we were 13 and started, those are the things that we talked about, you know, but they were wishful dreams and they seemed kind of distant on, on one hand. But on the other hand, we were listening to the radio, the, the, the real radio uh, in the Bay Area, the real R&B station and the real country station because of the, the shipyards brought lots of people from the South. That's where that, that, that music base came from in, in San Francisco from the war, World War II. And these guys, they needed a labor, skilled labor, labor force and they came from the, everywhere, but a lot came from the South and they uh, brought their music with them. Hmm. And they, there was, was enough of them that they could, uh, that had come out and stayed they loved beautiful weather, California, and there was a work there. I mean, there was a lot of reasons. The war is over. It's a new adventure for 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 a, a, a lot a lot of people, and um, uh, so that's what I I know. I listen more to more of the R and B. We saw the real R and B guys, uh, John Lee Hooker, and I you know, love John Lee Hooker. Yes, Muddy yeah. Waters, and, and and got to see him before we had made it. We, we used to sneak into uh, certain shows and, uh, um, and, 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 and and when you say we used to sneak into their shows, was it you and the guys in the band or, or no, just you and whoever? You, you who are you talking to? Uh, you, Cosmo. Sorry, you oh. said that you guys used to sneak into the John Lee Hooker shows and whatever. When you say yeah. you guys, are you talking about the guys in Credence or are you talking yeah. about just you and friends? The, the Fogarty brothers and Stu Cook and Doug Clifford. And you guys would all, you would, you would uh, sneak into shows? Well, we'd, we'd like to, we'd, we'd, we'd like to play, but we would go to places sometimes, uh, even just bars, you know, uh, and uh, I had that in the corner. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes they, they said, get the fuck out. <laughs> Pardon me, <laughs> they can say that. You know, here we are, miners, you know, walking into a, uh, a, a, an establishment that requires a liquor license, and uh, they, they were a lot easier to bust people back then. And, and so, when you guys were that young, were you guys together all the time? No, we were together on music musical ventures pretty much only. Okay, uh, you and I had a a, 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 a different relationship. Uh, we did a lot of things uh, besides the, uh, uh, music. We learned how to drink beer. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was it was a, a glorious time when around the birth of rock and roll, be part of that birth and uh, uh, and, and stay true to the genre. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we, well, that was a real steadfast thing you know this is what we're doing and, were you uh, let's, let's were you friendly better. with credence new ball too never i had only met him a couple of times he he was a, a older guy he worked tom worked at pg e 
So it was so, Tom who brought that aspect in. Yeah, he he brought us. I think to one of uh, we had a gig and uh, or it was going to uh, some uh, he was going to come to a session, but Tom wanted to introduce him to us because we uh, there was a possibility we were going to name it after him. Very f not not a real s strong possibility, but who knows what, what could happen, you know? But he was a nice gentleman, and but we decided that it, it, would, it would be just problems. Uh, he would eventually get a, a lawyer that would you know, come and want a piece of the action. And that wasn't the idea of it. The idea was, you know, credence, truth, honesty, and, and doing the right thing. And yeah, so we've, it's all part of the process. Of, uh, but, you know, I, it, was, it was a relief when it was over. I thought it was kind of wacky. You want to know the truth about it? I always have to this day. Credence Clearwater Revival. If you really think about it, it it's uh, uh, kind of it's kind of a, just an odd grouping of words. But when you unravel it and, and, and you know the, the 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 combination to the to the to the vault, uh, yeah, it, yeah, you know, it, it made a lot of sense. Did the guys in the band ever give you crap to shave? To, to a shave? Yeah, to get you rid of your beard or nah, they didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. No, they never did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I met Stu Cook about 13 years ago at a Dennis Quaid golf tournament in Austin, Texas. I was playing with Chris Mulkey and, sure. and uh, Stu and I actually sang harmony for Don Felder when he was on stage. Oh, neat. Yeah, he yeah. was a nice guy, man. Cool. Yes, cool. Yeah, I, I mean, we started, uh, uh, we met in the first day of school in the seventh grade. Uh, wow. Homeroom, the letter C. The letter C brought us together. And, you know, it, and it's, it's, a, it's also a key that a, a guy like me can learn, you know, put together a song to uh, crude enough to teach it to somebody else. So you can, uh, it's a songwriting tool. The key of C, my old pal Stu Cook. Credence. Yes. The three C's. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah yes. Yes, cool. indeed. Uh, you ever heard of uh, Rusty and Doug Kershaw, uh, Cosmo? Yes, I have. Cool. Yeah, they covered Bad Moon Rising, I saw. I listened to. So mm -hmm. it, it was, they're, it was they're, really, they're, really they're, good. They're, they're talented, talented boys. Yeah, it was cool. Yes. It was a little connection with you guys. And you I was working in a studio in Crowley about uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago. And uh, uh, Doug came in and recorded a, a Cajun record and a Zotico record. I was the engineer there at the studio, and um, so I spent probably two months with him in there. Wow, oh, so it was pretty fun. The, the, those Chris guys are talented boys. I tell oh, you. yeah, yeah. Uh, I yeah. like was that was my one for you, so it was uh. So Sammy's been married, was it four or five times on the internet? <laughs> and I'm like, a so bunch. He kept, it was how many? A bunch, a bunch. So he's been married. I lost track. Just, and but you've been around the whole time he kept you <laughs> pretty much yeah uh there was a time when um when i didn't play with him uh when he during during his record deal in the early years when he had another drummer playing with him and then the other drummer decided he, to get off the road so he called me and i went back out with him and but we played together before his record deal and after a little bit uh before his record deal, probably four or five years you know yeah he was in a band with my dad a country band with my dad wow. and i was playing in a rock band and um, after disco came in, I decided I needed to eat. So I kind of switched over to country, you know, yeah. <laughs> one of them deals. What are, uh, what are your favorite covers of, of uh, Credence songs? Uh, which ones speak to you the most, do you think, Cosmo? Heard it through the grapevine. Which one? Heard it through the grapevine. Oh, okay. But um, which is great. <laughs> and actually, I saw you on YouTube playing it. And it's just killer. Um, but what what bands cover CCR songs that you were like, were impressed with, blown away by, uh, you thought were neat? The idea came because of Rusty and Doug singing Bad Moon Rising or playing oh, it. Well, you know, uh, it's kind of a, uh, kind of a no-brainer. Uh, if I'm a little uh, rough in the throat, we've been, we're surrounded by forest fires mega forest fires where i live right now are you in norcal 
Beg pardon? Are you in Northern California? Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm Lake Tahoe. I have my business here and my studio here. Uh, and and uh, I've got uh, two granddaughters here. I've got five grandchildren total. Good. So, but it's, uh, we're on, we're on red, on the ready. I'm an honorary chief, fire chief. I uh, oh. did a, created a volunteer program for defensible space back cool. in the late eighties. And it, it uh, got bigger than I had any idea it would. Yeah. And, uh, got, it was a, the number one program in the nation. So deemed by the department of agriculture and then send guys out buses out. I lived in Incline village up at Lake Tahoe at the time. They yeah. send busloads of these guys from the Department of Agriculture and this, to see what we were doing. <laughs> and I spent half my time walking around uh, uh, politicking because these were uh, organizations, even though the governmental had money and we, need, we needed money to, to, to make, make it work and be successful. So I, I was, I guess, stumping without, without telling them that sometimes stardom uh, or celebrity, whatever you want to call it, uh, can be used for positive things. And uh, yeah, uh, that was a good program. Uh, probably the best thing I did in my my life because music is was a natural thing for me. Yeah, but this, was, this was I'm dealing with government at all levels and to getting laws changed in the state, uh, using the university to, for the biology of how how not to destroy the soil while you're trying to save it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty cool. <clears throat> so were there any bands that come to mind that uh, have covered Credence songs that you thought? And it finally like, make, me, make me answer it, aren't you? <laughs> well, no, we can skip it if you don't, if none that come to mind. You can oh, no, it. I'm kidding. I, 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 that's what I do. I tend to get going and, you know, I, I got a well, story going. We're all and, guilty of that. I think sometimes I, I go, hmm, how did I get here? I kind of like where I am right now, but, you know. Where did, what, where did I start? And uh, okay, I, I would have to say, uh, Ike and Tina Turner, uh, Proud Mary. Oh, yeah. man. Oh, man. We, we, we did uh, eight shows with them, or we, we were supposed to do eight shows with Ike and Tina Turner. And this is after she had c covered the song. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was actually her, at that time, uh, uh, her, her biggest hit. And uh, so it was placed in the show a certain way. But we were in Utah. We're in Mormon country where there's a lot of blonde haired pe people, you know, with, and they were wearing suit and tie, coat and tie, to, to our Creed the show when I can see in the Turner. And when she started doing the, the, the thing on the microphone, if you know what I'm talking about, your viewers won't, might not know, but they'll probably figure it out. She was going to end on that mic, uh, top and bottom, and I'm telling you what I saw these, these poor little blonde guys and gals faces turned bright red. It almost looked like a stoplight and a signal. <laughs> and, and remember, we we couldn't believe it, you know. And it was one of the coolest things I ever saw, uh, and one of the sexiest things I ever saw. And God Almighty. So that yeah, uh, I continue to turn and get get that bill, but we had to kick him kick him off the tour because Ike was beating up Tina. Oh really? And uh, after the second show, uh, he came up on stage and said, "I this is a new song I just wrote. It was the first time I ever played it." He played it. And it was a straight lift from "Born in the Bayou." I mean, John is saying, "That's uh, you know, what are you doing?" And so that was enough. They didn't finish the tour with us. And we wish Tina well, which of course, once she got rid of Ike, she did do well, very yeah. well. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Sweethearts, true sweethearts in the business. Yeah. Oh, that's a good Talented one. Talented sweethearts. Yeah. Um, I watched some interviews with Tom Fogarty, and it, it seemed like he was a very soft spoken person. Um, was he? And, and he seemed very, very, very different than John Fogarty when watching the two guys. In interviews, were they polar opposites? I, I would d define it as polar, uh, but Tom was a soft-spoken guy. That's and he is the guy that gave. He's the, first of all the guy with a sweet tenor. Uh, he had a Richie Valens tenor, 
and whereas you know, John's got the, the power tenor and, uh, and that's what we needed to, with, to, with this type of music. But Tom never in his wildest dreams thought that he would never sing a song ever with the band. Yeah. And uh, it was it, it cut and it cut hard because Tom had all those years, he could have gotten other people. But he stayed 10 years before we had a first hit record. And he was, you know, getting the, the, the deals, getting the studios, doing all the, all the work and giving up the book, being the vocalist, uh, pretty unselfish. And uh, uh, yeah, that's the kind of guy he was. And okay. I miss him. And uh, it's unfortunate that, you know, those things happen in the real world, but those things happen in the real world. And, and yeah. uh, we, we moved forward. Yeah, well, you have to. So. Uh, Saul Zintz, so when he signed you guys, were you guys flipping, were you doing cartwheels and you were really excited? This was, this was a big, big deal for you guys? Well, we didn't flip any cartwheels because I had a sore tailbone from uh, uh, a carnival in San Francisco. Uh, the week before, no, no, I, it's something that we had uh, worked on for a while, and uh, as young as we were, we had our parents co-sign for us. Wow! You know, if you see the original contract, you know, Tom was old enough, but we, the rest of us, weren't. Had to have our parents co-sign for us. That's nuts. So that's pretty. You know, being, you know, being a very unhappy uh, 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 relationship with Saul Zentz was the, the father that John lo lost in, in the divorce and was a big deal. And he took everything personally and didn't understand what the contracts that we had. Yeah. And, uh, we needed a pro and we needed also a guy that could be a mentor and get the brothers going and, you know the other side the paper part of it's you know is easy you, you get a guy that knows what he's doing what's the best for you and that all the t's are crossed and the i's are dotted but getting your brothers there you go and you know like the everly brothers and brothers in the in the beach boys and so many you know they're, they're those those relationships are different than than with other members of the band mm -hmm. and uh even though just about anything that they they do affects the other guys in one way or another but still not all of them and uh, we we desperately needed that who knows what we could have done but you know what one thing we did do is we, uh, we were the first band to to be number one uh, in, in the world after the beatles and we did it for two years in a row, and in and in, in really in a in a two year period because we did we put out five albums in in uh, in two years. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> Three albums in one year. It was a fast train to Georgia, buddy. Let me tell you. Yeah, we were busy, busy boys. So, what do you think? I you know, reading up on him, uh, Saul. So with a lot of the money he made, he funded films. And some of the films that he made was uh, One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Amadeus, and The English Patient. Right. So I think it could be argued that those films may not have been made without the money that he made from you guys. Oh, um, yeah. That's old news. We heard that. That's uh, the house that Creedence built and all that. It's you cool, know. you know, that the, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about the money, whether losing it or taking it or just putting the money aside it is the tentacles that can that can grow uh, off of it all off of off of off of you guys just playing. Um, well, you know, yeah, it's it's true. And in that sense, we're, we're we're attached economically, but we're, we don't we not in an investment way. We don't get any money for well, the money that we are, that we generated. But that's all, you know, that's all money and money doesn't really mean much when, uh, you know, you look at, look at what's going on in the world. We got a plague of, yeah. we got all these, everything, the shit is hitting the fan all at the same time. 
you know, the, the, the global warming is creating these massive fires and, and, and floods, and, and it's just starting. And uh, on, it's, 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 it's a, a very uh, difficult time. Yeah. Uh, the evening that you guys got your Rock and Roll Hall of Fame award, it seems like you, in the, in, in the, uh, in the interview that you did, you start off, you're the first speaker, and you seem very like surprised, like genuinely surprised that things made it that far. Um, you're elated, you're obviously excited, but you seem humble to be really honest. Were you genuinely that surprised that the band had the such longevity and, and all the rest of it? Yeah, it, it was a it was a very uh, it was a very painful night, and and uh, we John when he hands out punishment, it comes in all different forms, and uh, you know, and, but on the, at the same time, this 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 man is gifted talent talented wise vocal wise creative wise in so many ways uh, uh, and and i think it, just me but i i i i i, I, I actually I, I feel sorry for him or bad for him not sorry is not the word. i feel bad for him because it did it, we could all be barbecuing uh, chicken right now in the backyard, you know, and, and talking about the the session that we. But the, that it's not to be, and it's all, all I think part of part of the the, the the success. Credence became the goose that laid the golden egg for Saul Zance and those guys, but they they did offer us ten uh, percent of the company and. Uh, and the existing contract that we had mm -hmm. that was n never looked at. And John says to this day that it, that wasn't the deal. I happen to know for a fact that it was, but, but here we are now we're going, why even talk about this? I, you know, I got a record coming out. Yeah. Uh, with so the record I listened to it. guys. Yeah. Well, it's really neat. So what's neat is so Greg Ken band, Steve, Wright. And so he, Steve Wright, was from Northern California too. He's from where you're from. Did you guys know each other for, since kids or anything like that? Or no, no, he he was quite a bit younger than me, five or six years, I think. But I knew his brother, and his brother was uh, in between uh, our class. He was a, a, a grade lower than we were. He was he, when we, we were in the ninth grade. He was in the eighth grade, and so on. But he was a, a very handsome kid. But he was a wise guy. <laughs> he, I mean, he really was. He's the kind of guy that, you know, if things are going well, he can come in there and, and you know, and, and 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 get it mixed up. So he was going to. We we're going to change. I think Stu was going to go to bass, which he ultimately did from piano. But uh, he had, he played guitar. His name was Dave Wright, and uh, 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 he was going to be. <laughs> The rhythm guitar player and and you know we're going to be a real band with a, a real bass. <laughs> then I start thinking about it. I said, Jesus, you know, we played some pretty rough joints and we played some pretty rough joints around the, the Bay Area, along uh, you know, in the industrial area and close to those certain towns where you know where you're from, uh, you know. Yeah. And I said, we're going to all get get the shit kicked out of us and get our guitars broken. And so we 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 voted against have, having Dave Wright in the band. So uh, Steve Wright came to my house in El Cerrito. I actually, it was in a little town called Kensington, but it's just like really El Cerrito. That's where we, the high school when we were in junior high and all that. So uh, uh, he knocks on my door and, and introduces himself. I said, "I know your brother Dave." He says, "Yeah." Uh, and blah blah blah. He says, "I just, well, I'm, I'm, I just wanted to meet you and shake your hand." And I said, "Well, come on in." You know, blah blah. blah. And next thing you know, we're talking this and that and music, and and then it, 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 a couple of songs came out, and just like that, you know. And wow, let's why don't we see if we can put a writing thing together and 
take it as far as it'll go. And so that's that's where that, that record It really is from. good. I like it. It's called For All the Money in the World. And I thought it was awesome. I really I liked it. Thank you. That's good. So um so Eddie, I would am I correct in saying your father was uh happy that you were gonna become a professional drummer? Oh yeah, pretty much. Um I, I was backstage at a concert that they did with uh, George Jones and Tammy Wynette in New Iberia. I must yeah. maybe 10 years old and I've seen that and I knew that moment, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> this is what I want to do. And yeah. uh, at the time I was learning steel guitar. I, my, my father played the steel. I was learning that and a little bit of guitar. And uh, so I was going to be a guitar player. But the drummer in a little town in South Louisiana, where I was from, they, they moved. It was an all field town, basically. And uh Nobody, no kid had any drums and wanted to play rock and roll. So I said, Dad, I'd like to have some drums. And one thing led to another, and I just kind of was what I stuck with, you know. Well, it was a, it was a, sounds to me like you just kind of fell, fell in love right through the air. I mean, the, the drums said to, said to you, I'm coming in. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not leaving. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's a love, I'll tell you, God knows that I love him, but there's way too many guitar players in the world. Yes. Thank God, we, you know, there's at least one, one of us in a, in a band and we keep the order and keep, keep, it, keep, it, keep it moving uh, straight ahead. That's, that's our jobs and, and we, we love it. And, and uh, the, the, the worst part of it is seeing, depending on how many front men you have, all these butts in front of you. <laughs> yep. Yes, indeed. I play enough guitar just to get in trouble. That's about it, you know. That's about it. So, yeah. And um, Sammy and I, we've been knowing each other since we were kids. He was in the band with my dad, like I was saying. Yeah. And um, I would go and sit in with him sometimes when uh, 15, 16, when when the drum, their drummer was, was a state trooper. So some nights he couldn't make it. So I'd go play with him. And we, we just been friends ever since then, you know. Cool. Yeah, it is cool. Sounds like you got a good gig. Were yeah. your parents okay with you becoming Went a drummer? Huh? What's that? Were your parents happy with you going into music? Uh, my mother was very happy. My dad hated it. Oh, uh, what was dad's job? D dad was a machinist. He was, oh, my um, father was a machinist too. He was a really good one. He was kind of a guy ahead of his time when uh, the. Uh, uh, the Cal Radiation Lab opened up in Livermore, California. He was the foreman there, and that was at, the, at that time cutting edge. Uh, the stuff they were doing with they were making, you know, parts for rockets and 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 uh, the the big uh, atom smasher and things like that. So he was he was good at it, but he he didn't like that rock and roll. No, no, he didn't like he didn't like it. But he, he came. We won him over. We won him over. <laughs> I'm, I bet you did, yeah. So he was yeah. around later with all the success. He was alive. He was alive, yeah. But I had left home when I was uh, uh, finished my sophomore year uh, in in high school. And the family dissolved. And the parents finally got the divorce. They they were sa saving not to do for the kids. And the kids are going, why didn't you just get the damn divorce? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Go. Anyway, I, I, I ended up going and, and they ended up going. Uh, everybody went uh, their separate ways and, and uh, had a nice family that uh, made me the living gardener. And uh, they were really wonderful people. They, you know, kept me in. Otherwise, I would have had to move to San Jose. And, uh, and there goes the band, and, you know, and, and my wife. Uh, so th those are two pretty pretty major major right. thing yeah okay so when i first started uh the concept of putting together a podcast uh, i was at my buddy's house and my buddy has a daughter in fifth grade and the daughter said uh that i need to ask every single person uh when they first felt famous so bear in mind we're talking to a fifth grader it was her it was her idea but i love the question so it doesn't necessarily mean um that we need to focus on the fame aspect you're welcome to do so. But at a moment in your careers that you guys each felt like you were on the right path, there was a successful moment, there was a moment that meant something to you, a kernel in time that you're proud of. 
What would you guys choose? Well, there's there's a there's a couple. Uh, I think uh, it's sunk in with Green River. Green River was a number one album. It was our first number one album. And 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 Born in the Bayou is my favorite Creedence song to this day. I I I listen to that record from time to time, and it's like I'm listening to somebody else. Oh, you know what wow. I mean? It's like I'm listening to this record now, and it's coming out, and man, I really like it. These guys are 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 are, are doing it right, you know, and and, and it makes me feel a certain way. That's why yeah. I play, play music and why I play the, the music that generates those feelings. But um, uh, the one that really, when I, you know, Elvis was, uh, we uh, used the same touring company Elvis did. Okay. So Elvis was coming to Oakland to play the Coliseum, and he was a fan, and we found out from through the guys that, you know, that we were working with there, that, that, that company, touring company. He said, Elvis is, loves you guys and wants to meet you. We're going, holy shit. Yeah. One of the times when I was a little kid being you know, seduced by this music, I saw Elvis when I was 11 years old, blocked out from the waist down on the Ed Sullivan show. That did more for his career. And it wasn't, a, Ed did it as, as, as a fail safe thing. He didn't want Elvis. They didn't know what he was doing. They heard all these rumors about what he was doing. In today's world, it, you know, it's not much yeah well you know but anyway uh so anyway i i, I, I was going to see it on te television with the family my dad says well i'm taking you out to dinner no and so i kept getting up and going to the bathroom couldn't you couldn't walk into the bar uh they wouldn't let kids in there and i finally came to the time when elvis was there it came out and i leaned against leaned up against the door peeking out like this and uh, nobody said anything to me. They were all watching uh, Elvis Presley. What's he doing back there? He's taking his pants off. What's he doing? <laughs> What's he doing? Why did they wouldn't? If he wasn't doing something, they wouldn't have covered him up anyway. It, it turned out to be you couldn't have dreamed of a better way to promote him and have him be introduced to the world. Yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm finished my story. I'll be fast. I'm sorry. No, take your time. Teddy, I'm sorry. I'm taking so much of your time, buddy. Oh, that's okay, man. It's very interesting. I'm enjoying okay. it. Here, listen now. We're, Elvis is in the we're in the building, and he's he's in it's in the white jumpsuit days when he, he was at fit and you know and, and, and in his shape and, and bringing it every, on every turn. And uh, the lights come down. He walks up to the mic, shakes his head. So you see it in, the, in the, like diamonds. So, uh, sparkling in that, that's the sweat from his head and, he, and you, can, you can feel the building can calm down well what's, what's up he says i know they're out there i know they're out there this was for the credence boys two three four and goes into proud mary oh <laughs> oh yeah I, I i still get weepy when i when i talk about that one that is that's the all the, and then i knew i, I I, I was famous, but not near as famous as the guy that just tipped the hat to us. Yeah. God, you know, and, he, you know, that to, and does your song? Oh, it gives me chills. It's pretty, pretty, it's pretty amazing. That's the, yes. that's the king. But when we got back to meet him, Elvis had left the building. He had had a death threat and he had him just about everywhere he went. He was a ladies man, apparently. And, yeah. And left him in every port, and and guys wanted to to get him, and, uh, and so anyway, but I'll never forget it. What a what a cool thing to to do. And then to note, I mean, the guys he he was the king. He was uh, real as salt earth, you know, and uh, to to be anointed like that. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really, really cool. Really, really neat. That was good. What about you, Eddie? Well, I guess the first time I, I felt famous, I was about 17. We had a band called Black Dog. We, we were billed from Cypress Island, Louisiana, of course. We got hired to play on a Casey and the Sunshine Band in the Barquets tour. 
they thought we were from Cypress Island, Europe. No. Anyway, the first show we played, we were a Southern rock band, kind of a Cajun Southern rock band at that. And the first show we played was at uh, in Alexandria, Louisiana, and it was just a packed house. And man, that, that's the first time I ever felt famous, but we didn't do any more shows after that because what we played did no way fit with the bar case or Casey in the sunshine band, <laughs> you know, but that probably was the first time I think I ever felt famous. That was fun. That was good. <laughs> yeah. That was really good. I, I've got one. Uh, we were the a band called the Gollywogs and that was put on us by fantasy records and everybody knows we hated the uniforms and it was stupid. But we had a song called Brown Eyed Girl, not the one by Van Morrison, but uh, the one that John and Tom wrote. John sang the lead on it, and it was kind of a soulful, bluesy type of groove thing. Uh, and uh, Stu and I were going to San Jose State at the time. And uh, what was happening back then, you know, there was no internet. So people had uh, boom boxes, and they'd put cassettes in there and go from class to class and make a lot of noise you know and, and uh, a lot of professors wouldn't like it but at the time you know it, 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 it was uh, legal and that little brown-eyed girl song goes up to number one in the market we're number one in san jose and we're going to san jose state whoa buddy oh, yeah you're cool, cool. Oh. so I, I was walking by going to i was going to a history class i remember it it was the only class i, I got to be in and uh, uh, that year anyway. Um, so uh, he's, our song comes on in the boom box and he's, going, and he's grooving to it. It's the number one song, you know, hey, this, you know and I, I said, hey, that's me and my band, band, I'm playing drums there. And he says, that's not you. I said, that's me, I'm not kidding you. That's my band. He says, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I just, Gee, I felt famous for about a, two minutes. <laughs> and then, I, and then I got un, then I got unfamous. <laughs> That's really cute. That's that is great. Story. I love it. True story, man. What's some of the strangest gigs you guys have had? Um, I think my favorite thus far is the guys from Blessed Union of Soul. They they played a Girl Scout jamboree. <laughs> they're like but wow even, they're like it's even worse they're like the headliner with the temptations we were the opening band and so that that might be but i've had some pretty entertaining answers but is, is there any uh, gigs that come to mind that you remember that were just uh, yes what do you got one time we did a it was a advertisement for a radio station in lafayette louisiana and we played at an alberton supermarket in the produce section <laughs> at 11 o'clock in the morning that's the weirdest gig I think I've ever played. That's great. <laughs> I was set up by the cucumbers. Someone was set up over here by the milk, and we were spread out. But we played We played for like 45 minutes in the grocery store. That was the weirdest thing I've ever done, I think. That's wow. amazing. <laughs> so that's a good one. Yeah, I love that. That's a good <laughs> Do you yeah. got any fun ones, Cosmo? It's six nights a week, man. I know that's a lot six of gigs. Nights a week, yeah. Uh, what, we, what we would do... Uh, uh, we, 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 the economics, uh, 1A, and this is uh, the bar business as a, as a business and an entity. Man buys a bar and he fills it full of alcohol and he sell, gets a band or gets uh, music and turns it up loud and, and turns the air conditioner on and gets them all hot and sweaty and then it gets to the point where the, either the, he tells the man to take a break or, uh, you know, it, it's coming down. Well, anyway, now they're, you know, there's nothing to do except get cool again. So they go up to the bar and buy two mugs and <laughs> drinking the beer and you know, getting, that'll get them more lively to dance later on. But that's, that's it. That's bar economics. You, if you're going to make an investment in, 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 in a band, Boy, oh boy, that was how you, you made it in the old days. You didn't make any money. You, no. You, 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 you literally were, you, you were poor. You were, you were poor. Yep. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I, I didn't complain about the five sets. I said, why don't you make it six? You know, we have to close the place up or the cops will shut, it, shut us down. Oh, because I, you know, love playing. It was, those were the, you know, the innocent days of, 
there were two, yeah. and, and I, I've always been an, an athlete, and, and I, I like to compete. Uh, and uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a good sport, so don't worry about that. I am now. <laughs> but anyway, there were two ban other bands that were playing in the same area, same markets there, and in, in uh, uh, San Jose and uh, Davis, California, is a college town, Sacramento area. And one band was called the New Breed, and the other band was called Sparrow. And Sparrow was John Kay and the boys. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, the, the uh, uh, New Breed was Timothy B. Schmidt, bass player for the wow. Eagles. And uh, they, they were in a band before that, that the uh, former bass player came from so uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it but uh, I can't do it but anyway we, we were competing for the same gigs we we liked each other and we we liked the, the music that, that they were making but on the one hand we liked it but we didn't want to like it because we didn't want them to take our, our gig sure yes. compete on the street man yeah Sam and I had a gig in Lafayette at a little club that set maybe 40 people. We played six nights, just before his record deal, we played six nights a week from eight o'clock till two in the morning, no breaks. And Sammy could sing any, any genre of music just about, man. He's an incredible singer. And he would sing all night from eight till two in the morning, six nights a week, sick or not, and just every night. It, it, was, it was a lot of fun, but it was a lot of work too. Oh yeah, yeah. people don't realize, you know, uh, and, and now, you can you can make a, a record in, in your bedroom and not know how to play an instrument. Yep. Yeah, that's right. But you know, but it's it's changed the dynamics of the record industry, and and it's become a, a singles industry. Right. Uh, and and that really takes a, takes a lot of revenue out. So you want to sell those al albums? That's where the money is, man. The singles are the are the teaser. Make you want to, you know, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm uh, promoting a record right now. We have a, have a single. It also happens to be the name of the album that for obvious reasons. And there's good music on in there. In there and, but you can't go up the charts unless you get airplay. You, right. you can't get airplay unless you get, get uh, put on, on a, a set list. Yeah. And that's, you know, uh, Without radio made Creedence Clearwater Revival, I wouldn't be sitting here right now if it wasn't for radio and it was done differently. They had sheets, guys, song pickers, and they would pick uh, yep. uh, these, make these sheets and put them together and, and sell them as a magazine or as a sheet, they called them in those days. And, and, and stay, stay, and they were pretty, they had to, had, they had to be accurate. So they're they pretty good on the ear. Either that, or there was might have been a little payola somewhere along the lane, line, uh, but uh, we don't want to talk about that. That's that's <laughs> in the old days. That's that's gone. But anyway, uh, uh, he's the guy that said Suzy Q was a hit. So without his name was Bill Drake. He was like the top guy, top song picker. And uh, so well, thank you, Bill. And then uh, the, the second album had to have a, uh, an original single on it or we will be a one hit one day. And uh, we thought Bayou would be, you know, has, it's quarter note beat, it's danceable, it's, it's good to learn Proud Mary to tell you the truth. But and that's, doesn't mean I don't like Proud Mary. It means I just like Bayou better. But anyway, uh, 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 that's, uh, uh, that's what we did. And uh, I completely forgot what, what I was talking about. <laughs> it happens you know I've, I've recorded born on the bayou probably playing drums with four or five different cajun artists down in louisiana oh, that they've man. recorded and re, you know um it's, it's it's still a big song down there cajun you know with accordion and stuff do you uh know the texas tornadoes yes yeah they're doug Sam was one of my my very best friends in the business I did three albums with him, produced two of them. And so I know him, he's a hard one to control. Boy, uh, quite the character, but once you get him down, he, 
and, and get him to open up those talents. That guy is the most talented guy I ever worked with. And yeah. It was hard to hard to get him settled on on the steering wheel going in the same direction. But uh, when when he, when he did, man, uh, he, he's a guy that could look at an instrument and not even know how it's played until you show him. And and, 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 and an hour later, he's playing tunes. What was the chorus on that last? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ciao. I you know, know one of the one of the first songs I ever learned on drums was um, um, "Down on the Corner." Oh wow! One of the first songs, yes. Uh, it, um, the guy in the back, uh, the guitar player, the guy who was singing at the time, we were we were young. That was one of the ones he could sing pretty good, you know. Oh, yeah. And so uh, that was one of the first ones we ever played that I learned that we played out in public. Oh wow! Well, that's, you know, uh, when uh, John brought that one to the band to learn, uh, I, I, at our coffee break, we drank a lot of coffee. Uh, I said, why, why, are we, why are we doing, doing, that's a Calypso song, you know, and we have been all those years, oh, we're going to stay in, in the rails. And so I, you know, I said, you know, it's a Calypso song. He says, well, it's going to be a rock and roll song, but uh, that you, you, know, you got to figure it out. So uh, I would uh, use uh, cassette players, put them on the floor and get parts of songs and take them home at night, put a, uh, the one track on a four track machine and try different ideas on different songs. And uh, so I'm doing the homework and sure enough, uh, ended up with, with kind of a cross between Calypso and rock and roll. And the key to it is it's as simple as pie. Right. It's, and I, man, I, I labored over that, that, that thing. And I, I, you know, I really hoped that, that he was gonna like it because I, I was liking it now. I'm going, yeah, fuck yeah, this thing. So anyway, he uh, obviously must have because it's, 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 they're still playing it. That's a great song. Yes. Um, do you think on Mardi Gras, if there had been a big hit out of one of the songs that you and Stu had written, there would have been another CCR album? Or do you think that was going to be the final album, regardless of anything? I think it was probably going to be the, the, the result of that. He was ready to go and do it. He wanted to do a country thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, get a, get away from uh, uh, the rock and roll for a while, and uh, but uh, yeah, I, it, it was it, it was over, and uh, there wasn't going to be a hit from Stewie and I, unfortunately. But uh, that yeah. was an ultimatum that we should have seen coming, and we didn't, and uh, we paid 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 for it. And the first time uh, something happens. Uh, it, it, it's it's your fault. Second time, it's my fault. We should have never done that album. And I, that's when people say they have no regrets. People lie. I have lots of regrets. The key uh, to it is learning from the mistakes that you make as best you can for a positive uh, outcome. And it, it's it's over. We did it, uh, and uh, it was part of the the. Uh, Strange, strange way, and, and no, no more, no more encores was another thing that you know, took the heart out of the band. You know, that's what you play for and had all your career. And so yeah, having said, we're not ever doing them again. Their encores are phony. Woo! Yeah, that, that, that then you have then you have the the double encore where they <laughs> where yeah. when you come back again. Anyway, you know, those are all negative things I, uh, that I was. I said I wouldn't get into you're a sneaky little booger. Uh oh, now I'm in trouble then. Okay, now we'll, we'll back <laughs> off. We'll back off. But anyway, like I say, with the, no matter what happened on on the one side, on the good side, what what counts and matters uh, is the music. And you and, know, too, it's too true. It, it really is. And I don't know. You know, I, I had a. Have you ever heard of the band Fishbone? Oh sure. Okay, so. 
the singer of Fishbone Group crossed street from me, and he's a, he's a good buddy, and he's kind of like an older brother. I look at him that way, and I had the bass player on last night, and <laughs> I brought up a couple stories, and they get into it, and it's all this stuff. But they met each other in junior high school. It's sort of similar as you, you know, you kids, you grow up together. I think it's impossible to not argue a bit because you're, you're together all the time, having toured for a little while. It's tough, man. It's stressful. It's tiring. There's a lot of components. I think it would be, I think it would be expected to have issues. Unfortunately, you know, the, the whole powder keg blowing is not what anybody wants, but maybe these things happen, you know, but you, you had a lot of albums in a couple of years that were awesome. And also I like the stuff that you've done since. So, uh, you know, I don't think it should be downplayed. The, the album that you guys, I, I listened to both magic window was awesome. And for all the money in the world is also really good. And so I hope they're all feathers in your hat, you know? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. It's sincere. Here's a fun one. So us roadies, we love wind-ups. And um, are we all familiar with what a wind-up is? Do you guys know? So a wind-up is a joke. They're actually kind of mean because roadies are mean. <laughs> so did you guys, did you play antics like this back in the in the early 70s and stuff? Did you guys ever play jokes on each other? I would imagine yeah. the answer is yes. But do you no, remember I mean, any? I was a wild man. I was the guy that uh, very, very athletic. Uh, maybe five percent body fat. I mean, I you know. Oh wow! One of those wiry guys. And, Cosmo uh, was a factory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I climbed up in the in the rigging above the stage in the in, uh, uh, what's the big venue in New York? Uh, uh, Jones Beach. No, no. Uh, the famous old building. Roseland. No. Big, the big, 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 big win. Uh, anyway, uh, it'll come to me. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, during the sh during a, 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 a I think. A, a oh, Madison a, Square Garden. Madison Square Garden. Okay, sorry. Around <laughs> around that little and, tiny blimp. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, I, and I'm doing it, and, and uh, uh, some Hell's Angels came backstage. I'm up in the rigging. They go into our dressing room and shut the door and you know i'm going whoa this is kind of scary turns out that our pilot co-pilots best friend growing up was the president of this that chapter of the hell's angels oh. uh, and and uh, they they were just fans and wanted to know if you know we, we needed anything and uh, you know no th <laughs> thanks oh, we're good. <laughs> I'm good i'm up here i'm staying up here uh, but I I, 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 I took a, a sheet off of a bed and put it in a hallway and took poured ketchup all over it and laid under it. I actually found a, climbed up an ele on the top of an elevator. Was operating the elevator from the root, from the, the top part of it. People were getting in there and I was making noises and freaking people out. And this is the Madison Square Garden? No, no, this was at the hotel. Oh, okay. And with the mattress, where was that? uh the, the the what now the match mattress with the ketchup all over it oh i don't remember where, where it was just another, another hotel <laughs> shenanigans man shenanigans yeah. <laughs> that's good hey, what about you eddie you, you got some you got man some we stuff? i pulled some stuff on some people i i still got some people pissed off at me for shit i pulled on them ah. uh just the, the best the, the, here lately, though, the, the fun stuff is messing with Doug. Um, he worked with Sammy for a while, and then he went on with Aaron Tiffin, which I think you had Doug on the other day. Yeah, Doug Larson and Doug Larson. Um, great. Okay. The best thing for Doug is to wait till he's putting out the set list, and, and I'll go up and say, Doug, they, they changed the list. What do you mean they changed the list? I just I just uh -huh. typed these wrong. You have to do it again, man. And I give something different. He'll go to it. And he had it right the first time. And, and I mean, he falls for it at least once every other week, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so uh, Doug, Doug's a great guy. He's just fun. It's, it's always something with Doug, you know? But back in the day, we, we pulled some weird stuff. We had a manager who was a little wiry guy with, in one of the rock bands, and we were staying at a hotel 
a three-story hotel and the pool was right underneath the rails. We were on the third floor. And um, so, man, I, I went beat on his door and he opened the door and I just waved at him and bailed off into the pool off the third, you know, off the, the balcony there. And man, he lost it. He oh. thought he didn't know what was going on. And man, he, he, he was bad. He was really bad. I was maybe 17 at the time. <laughs> he, he was pretty bad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I got I got to show you something. Here. Yeah, please. Hang on here. There you go. Can you see that? Uh, up a little, up a little, up a tiny bit. Oh, it's you. Okay. That's uh, at at uh, when when my dad came backstage at the, at the, uh, the uh, Coliseum, Oakland Coliseum, after the show. Take it up, put it up a little bit more, just a little higher. So that's you. Or, oh, no, that is you. Okay, that's you. Yeah, you're in good shape, man. Breaking symbols and, 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 and things to get you in shape. Yeah, I bet. You know, I toured with uh, the Chili Peppers and Chad Smith is the drummer. Yeah. That dude plays hard, man. I mean. He does play, play hard. He's a beast. <laughs> he, is a, he is a beast, and I, I, I you know, I, I've, uh, I've had to rebuild my my right shoulder. Yeah, thirty million eighth notes. I'm surprised he hasn't had surgery. I mean, he is an an, an animal. He's animal whales on him. They change the heads, or I don't know. Is that common? Do you guys change the heads every night at shows anyway? Or nah, he changed. We they change them every night because of him. Every every wow. every every third night. It used to be when I was using two B sticks to be or not to be. Uh, oh, never mind. Yep. Uh, uh, but now I'm now I'm using five Bs. I have Parkinson's, so uh, yeah. You know, I, I just finished a two-hour session. That's the longest I played since I retired from the road, which was uh, in twenty uh, about a year year and a half, and I. I was just, I, I, it's, it's hard to explain it, but you, you, you don't get, the, you feel tired a lot. And, uh, you know, and I, I just said, just playing along with CDs, I like playing music, but I don't like just sitting there tapping on the drum. And, uh, and I just said, man, I'm going to beat this little sucker up tonight or today. And I just start going, and next thing I know, I get a phone call that, you know, it's time to get ready for the podcast. And I'm wow, <laughs> two hours, two hours. That's uh, who reminded you? I should, I should thank them, shouldn't I? I reminded myself. Oh, all right. What drum set do you play on? Are you guys the same as guitar players, where the drum sets are like super sexy when they're special, or it's no, not quite I, I, nothing fancy. I use DWs. I had a deal with DW that uh, the, we backlined all of our year, and that allowed us to, you know, to have a wider uh, a spiral to to play in. It gave me, um, uh, you know, you could play more more dates if you can, uh, you know, have the, the equipment there and ready to and then in good shape we kind of pioneered that and now uh, it ended up a lot of these rental companies were buying stuff for just for us you know i, I don't know what amps the guys use you know from fenders and all, I, I, I don't know much about it but yeah i i have to have the dw's and i had camcos back in the day dw bought camco out and they still have the same lugs on, on them as they did when they were called camco wow so, yeah. Uh, so those show up. So what I have in my house is a V drum. They're electric drums. They're rubber. <laughs> They're metal and rubber. And yep. that, that's so. And and I actually have a nylon type of material for the head, so it, it bounces more uh, yep. like a real a real head. But uh, you know, I I can play a, a ear splitting volume at two in the morning. My wife's asleep in the next room. And they and just don't turn the speakers on you know i have headphones i can i can listen to music at four if i want to cool yeah yep i have a set of b drums here at the house downstairs in my little studio uh i have a couple of old 70s kits of ludwig that's my favorite drum i just um 
on stage, I've been uh, playing an old set of Lurick I had, and I just got a new set of Mapex about oh, three weeks ago. Congratulations. Yeah. I had a set, my first new drum set ever. I bought an old oh, a set from the 30s, and uh, they'd spray painted the whole thing, and and it had the the Tom the Tom's heads on the bottom were tacked on. That's yeah. how it was. And That's it super neat. Like this, that were like you know you hang, hang the symbol in here, but uh, they were my first set and, uh, and uh, broke me in. Then I uh, when the Gollywogs had a had a semi hit, we made enough money to to do something, and none of nobody bought any anything but musical equipment. We, we, yeah. I, I got a new set of Ludwigs, Silver Sparkle. Man, yep. brand new set. And uh, uh, I, was, I, I was really happy with the guys got amps, different amps. So, you know, we, we reinvested and uh, uh, we, we wanted it. We wanted it bad. It took us 10 years. Huh. Yeah. Are you still talking to Stu Cook all the time? Yeah, yeah. It's got to be your oldest friend. <laughs> That's a long time to be friends with somebody. It goes back so far, I can't count that high. <laughs> yeah, we, we've, we, we've seen some wacky shit in, in our time and, and been part of a pretty uh, amazing uh, dream and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and stuck with it and, 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 it, and it happened. You, see, you can have a dream. And that's great, but if you don't do something with it, it's yeah. it's just a dream. I mean, it's it's it's, it's uh, there's really not much not much to it. But yeah. if, if you want something, you've got to want it more than the guy standing next to you. And uh, well, when they had that, when Cosmos Factory came out, were you did you look at did you have a moment that you looked at it and you were proud, or were you so busy cranking out music that it just flew by night? I had I had moments when it got when it was quiet uh, uh, after you know rehearsal and everybody's gone home for dinner and uh, uh, kind of look around and just go Jesus you know from my my backyard dribbling a basketball we were, we were playing a game of three uh, uh, you know Stu and John and I and uh, I grabbed the ball. And, 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 and like to stop play, I came up and I said, one night, some night, we're going to be making a hundred bucks a night. And then I let a little time pass. I said, each. <laughs> we, we, laughed, we laughed so hard that we fell on the floor, on the ground and laughed. Those are the, those That's are the a things. beautiful moment. Man. We we're 13, 14 years old. I was always the clown. I always had. So, what would you have done with your hundred bucks? <laughs> a new bicycle, <laughs> basketball hoop. <laughs> uh, they, I, don't, I, I probably would have bought another drum set. Right answer, huh? Did you ever play anything else uh, other than percussion type stuff? No, I use the piano as a as a tool for songwriting, but I don't play the piano. <laughs> if, yeah, if that makes any sense. Stu's a good uh, piano player. Yeah, he, he well, he was, I and mean, he doesn't play. I don't know that he even has one in his house. Wow. Yeah, he was. His left hand was our bass when we were an instrumental trio. That's how how quiet we were, you know. <laughs> That's good stuff. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your guys' this time. If you had any other more stories, you're welcome to tell. I'm not trying to cut you short. Uh, uh, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, it's been fun. I, I appreciate it, and uh, so it's That's good. I'm going to run, boys. Thank you for your time, Cosmo. Oh, you're yes, welcome. nice meeting you. It really was. Nice it meeting you, Eddie. Was. Yes, you too. You remember, there's only one drummer. That's it. <laughs> and a sea of guitars. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. It's an amazing world out there. Nice talking with you. My pleasure. Hats boys, off. Be healthy and um, peace in the world. Yes, sir. Keep swinging. To you too. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye bye. So anyway, we, we, like I was saying, we, we, we did this show. I think it was around Washington State somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where it was. I don't really remember. Anyway,
we, we, we had a bus and it had this little small pool trailer, little camper that was maybe, I don't know, 16 feet, you know, we could go in, it was by the stage. So me, fiddle player, bass player, and a couple of the guys are in there. So we walking around and that's where they had, you know, like some snacks and candy boards and stuff. So I pick up a Hershey bar and I take a bite and, and I open it. I say, what's this? I open the door and there's this little bathroom in there. So, oh, so I close the door, right? But there's no water in it. So anyway, so I um, take the, um, I'm sitting in there thinking, I said, and I'd already got the fiddle player jokingly with a few other things. So, man, I smeared this, I put some random little bit, you know, put a little coke on my hand and smeared the, the chocolate candy ball over my hand. So there's a gap under the door about three inches. So, man, I said, hey, man, is there any toilet paper out there? He goes, oh, what? God. I said, is there any toilet paper? He goes, I don't see nothing. I said, how about paper towels? He goes, yeah. I said, pass me some under the door. And when he stuck his hand under the door, I grabbed it with that chocolate all over it. <laughs> and I didn't tell anybody I was doing it. And so, man, he starts going, whoo, whoo. <laughs> screaming and hollering and everybody in there they all going oh my god so finally i opened the bus open the door and i'm going I, i'm licking my hand i said there's only chocolates <laughs> you know? that's a good one that's oh good man one. and they see they still teasing him about that he's, he's no longer playing with us now but oh that's really this is what sammy that's, that's some of the cleaner that's stuff the, i mean that's I, on the is that roots and boots stuff yeah, that's well, that's a Sammy. That was a Sammy. Yeah, with Sammy. That's really funny. Hey, thanks for watching Party Like a Rock Star. If you're not already subscribed to the Facebook or YouTube channels, do it. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. The handle is Party of Stars. Thanks for watching. You'll see you next time.